Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. And today I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 beginning with with verse 1 says this, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. For the tabernacle was prepared, the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, and behind the veil, the second veil, the part of the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid on all the sides of the, the on all sides with gold, in which were the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. For these things we cannot speak now in detail. Lord, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I I pray that in a very powerful way here as we we look at your word, Lord, as we look at the typology that's involved here, that it would come alive and that we would see the Old Testament, Old Covenant tabernacle in a way that we never have. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, today's message is entitled The Tabernacle, a Shadow of Jesus Christ. And we're going to be taking a look at at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 15. Now, as we've been going chapter by chapter through this book, what, what we've seen is we've seen that the, the writer is, is bringing forth the point that Jesus is superior to, Jesus is better than. And he goes on for all of these things that relate to the Old Testament, relate to Judaism. Jesus is better than the prophets. Jesus is better than the angels. Jesus is better than or superior to Moses. Jesus is superior to Joshua. Jesus is superior to Aaron and to the Levitical priesthood. Jesus, last week we saw, is superior to the covenants. The the new covenant is better than the old covenant. But today we're going to go into a different area, and that area that we're going into today is the tabernacle. And so as we, we go through this, this can tend to be a little bit difficult, but I'm hoping through the pictures that I share, through the descriptions that I give, that I can bring this alive in a way in which you can understand. In Hebrews chapter 9, we see the details that are contrasted, at least in the first half of that, verses 1 through 15, uh, the, the details contrasted between the two tabernacles. Some of you might be out there saying, why would I want to go back into the Old Testament and look at the tabernacle? Why? It, it, it doesn't interest me. Are you aware that the tabernacle is spoken of in 50 chapters in the Old Testament? Not five chapters, 50 chapters. And if there's an object that's in the Old Testament for that many chapters, there's got to be a message for you and for me. Something is being taught to us, and we need to see that. And so we're going to go ahead and and gradually work through that today, and and I hope it helps to enlighten you to the importance of of this this object lesson, if you would. Verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 9 says this. It says, Then indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. Now, the covenant was commanded by God. In fact, uh, I should say the tabernacle was commanded by God. I'm sorry. But the tabernacle, actually the word tabernacle in the Hebrew means tent. And it was a large tent that was divided into two parts. This tabernacle was 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. 
And as we go through this, I, I think it's important for us to realize that the tabernacle is a very large object lesson. It's, God is pointing something to us. And what he's revealing to us is he's revealing to us the need for Jesus Christ. You see, the tabernacle was only a temporary uh, place of worship. It was never intended to last forever. It was made of animal skins. And uh, every time they moved, they would have to take it apart. And then they would have to put it back up. And they would have to repair the the skins or uh, make adjustments as they went along, but the tabernacle was never intended to last forever. What it was intended to do is point us to the ministry of Jesus Christ, what Jesus would do for us as Savior and High Priest. Verse 2 goes on, and it says, For the tabernacle was prepared the first part, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. Now, as we take a look at the inside of the tabernacle, you can look at what it would look like as they set it up out in the desert. And remember that it's a, it's, a, it's a big tent, but on the outside we had the, the outer courtyard. And as we look at the different pieces of furniture in here, you'll see on, on, in the outer courtyard was the altar of burnt offering in which the animals were, were offered. You had the, the, the laver, which came up next, which is where the priests would wash and cleanse before they went on into the inside of the, the sanctuary. There were three objects that were on the inside. To the, to the north, you, you had the table of showbread. To the south, you had the golden lamp stand. A little further up by the veil, what you had is the altar of incense. And then behind the veil, in the Holy of Holies, you had the Ark of the Covenant. And so that kind of gives you a, a layout. I think it's really important for us to, to realize at this point that there's a difference in the makeup of the materials as we're going along. On the outside, the altar of burnt offering is made of bronze. As we look at the, the laver, that laver is made of bronze. Everything within the tabernacle is pure gold. Now, the question is why? In the Bible, bronze is symbolic of judgment. Bronze is symbolic of the judgment of God, but as we move into the tabernacle, we see the gold, which is symbolic of the holiness and the purity of God. Well, in those two sections we see, it's broken into to two sections. Uh, the section here, the holy place, was used often by the priests. You see uh, Zacharias in the days of John the Baptist is in there, and he's actually working on the altar of incense when the Ab uh, angel Gabriel ends up coming to him. But then you see that the holy of holies is a square 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. It's a cube. And there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that in just a moment here. William MacDonald writes, The tabernacle itself measures about 40 feet, 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, and 15 feet high. It was divided into two compartments. The first was the holy place, which was 30 feet long, and the second, the most holy place, was 15 feet long. The tent consisted of a wooden framework covered by goat's hair, curtains and weatherproof drapes of animal skins. These coverings form the top, back, sides of the tent, and the front of the tab tabernacle was embroidered veil. Now, it's interesting that as we look at the Holy of Holies, it's 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet, which is a square, or another, thing that, another way we could call that is that it's a cube. Now, I want you to think ahead into the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 16, when the New Jerusalem is being described. And it too is described as a square. It too is described as a cube. Only this time it's 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles. Is that a mere coincidence? And I have to say absolutely no. Because the cube in the Bible was the description of utter perfection. And so when you see the Holy of Holies, where, where, where God's dwelling place was on earth, it's utter perfection. When you see in the New Jerusalem that cube, 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles by 1,400 miles, it's speaking, it's giving you the message that is absolute perfection. Well, the first part of the tabernacle, or the holy place, had three pieces of furniture, as I explained just a moment ago. And the first piece of furniture I wanted to talk about is that of the golden lamp stand. And we've got a magnificent replica of the golden menorah or golden lampstand in Jerusalem today. In fact, it's out 
outside right by the western wall when we're over there we're able to walk up and 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 see this this menorah and, and it's it's incredible it's it's made out of 24 karat solid gold and it's huge and you walk up to this menorah and by the way in Israel they're beginning to make the furnishings for the future temple that's going to be coming and so they're preparing. They're getting the priestly garments. They're getting everything ready. They've got the menorah. The menorah is outside encased in glass for those, those, those worshipers to walk up and, and see what it would, would look like. But this thing weighs 99.2 pounds of pure gold, if you can imagine that. And we're looking at it, and they're saying, this, this thing's solid gold. We're wondering, what is the value of that? Well, I got on the internet, and I figured out what, what 45 kilograms or 99.2 pounds of 24 gigabytes carat gold would be worth today. And today's value is $1,835,740, if you can imagine that. And it's absolutely beautiful. But as you look at that menorah and you see how beautiful that is, you can imagine the menorah that was in the tabernacle and that it was solid gold. It was absolutely beautiful with the flower buds and everything else that was on there. Well, the lampstand is symbolic of Jesus Christ. And it's Jesus who tells us that himself. In fact, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I want you to think about the inside of that tent. No windows. It's dark. You can't see a thing. You need the lampstand in order to be able to see for the priests to do their priestly work. And as we look today and we see that Jesus is the light of the world, would you agree with me that the darker the darkness, the brighter the light? And Jesus brings the hope. Jesus brings the, the, the light of the world. Well, the second piece of furniture that we see in there is the table of the showbread. Uh, it's it's uh, acacia wood overlaid with gold, but on it are 12 pieces of bread. In fact, this, this particular uh, table of showbread is two cubics long by two cubics wide by a cubic and a half high. And you say, well, what in the world is a cubic? How can I figure out what a cubic is? Do you know how they measured? The size of the average man. They would take the arm. And they would go from the bottom of the elbow to the tip of the figure, to the tip of the middle finger. And that was considered a cubic. It's somewhere in the area 18 inches. I'm not quite sure exactly, but, but that would be considered a cubic. So when you see it, you can measure these devices or, or these objects by that. The, the length of the table of showbread is two cubics long, two arm lengths here. Uh, the, it's two cubics wide. It's a, a cubic and a half high. And on top of it, it had 12 loaves of bread. Now, what were the 12 loaves of bread symbolic of? Well, under the Old Testament, and that's what the writer of Hebrews is looking back to, we see the 12 tribes of, of Israel. Today, for, for Christians, we see the, the 12 apostles, don't we? But in this particular case, it's looking back to the 12 tribes of Israel. Each Sabbath day or each Saturday, all of the bread would be removed, but it was to be eaten by the priests in the temple area. And I got thinking about the symbolism on that and why, why would that be? Do you realize that, that we can't go too long without physical food? I mean, some of you are probably sitting here thinking before the service is over, I'm going to be starving to death. I'm going to want to have something to eat. Well, there's some truth to that, isn't there? Because we can only go so long. We've got to eat physically so that we can be strong physically. And even symbolically, this, this bread that would sit before the Lord, the priests would take it on the Sabbath and they would begin to eat it. And it would give them physical strength to do the ministry that God had called them to do. But there's something for us to learn from this as well. In order to survive, we need to eat physical food. But in John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus said to them, he said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He who believes in me shall never thirst. There's a difference, isn't there? The, the Jews didn't understand. They're saying, what is he saying? I'm the bread of life. You know, later on he goes, unless you eat my flesh, unless you drink my blood, you've got no part in the kingdom of God. And the Jews are looking at him saying, what are you talking about? We don't believe in cannibalism. No, they don't. And there shouldn't be cannibalism. And, and there isn't cannibalism. But Jesus wasn't talking physically, was he? How was Jesus talking? 
spiritually. You see, because for you and for me to be strong physically, if, if we don't ever eat the Word of God, if we don't ever digest that which the Lord has given to us, we'll become weaker and weaker and weaker until we just, we just disappear spiritually. You know, uh, it's important for you and I, Jesus is the bread of life. And we need to feast on him. He needs to become a part of us in the sense that the more we feast on him, his word begins to be lived out within our lives. And to do the priestly work in the world that Jesus has called us to do today, we need to feast on his word on a daily basis. We need to spend time in prayer. We need to spend time in the fellowship of believers. Verses 3 and 4. And behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which, in which were the, the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that had budded, and the tablets of the covenant. And so the third piece of furniture that we see inside the tabernacle is that of the altar of incense. And the question is, is what did that symbolize? Well, what that altar of incense symbolized and the smoke that would be going up from the coals was the prayers of God's people. Now, what you need to see here, because there's a little bit of symbolism, in fact, I need to go to the, the next slide to show that. Uh, what you need to see here on this slide here is that between the holy place, right here, which the, the priests constantly went to morning and evening to, to work on the, the coals for, or the oil for the, the light and, and uh, just to work on the altar of incense, there was a veil. And the reason for that veil is that it separated the holy place from the most holy place. So in the, in, in, in the holy place, it was tended every day by the priests. But the most holy place, or the holy of holies, could only be entered when? Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, only after extensive preparation of the high priest with sacrifices for himself, sacrifices for the, the Jewish people. But he would do so with a basin of blood. He would have to enter by the blood. And so we've got the symbolism here of the veil that's separating. And watch what happens. It gets quite interesting here because in the book of Exodus, we saw that the, the, the altar of incense was located in the holy place. But as we look at what happens in the book of Hebrews, all of a sudden they're saying that the altar of incense has been moved into the holy of holies. Now, why would they do that? Why, why would the author do that? There's a couple of, a couple of explanations. What some of the people say is they say, okay, uh, we've got the altar of incense on the outside with the veil which blocks. That veil is symbolic of the sin that, that has separated us from going to God. That We, just, we can't do that. Only the high priest, only, only a, a mediator can go in there on our behalf. And only once a year. Well, the priest would go in there with the, the burning coals, but it's almost as if the veil is, is blocked from the, from the prayers. But what happened in Matthew chapter 27, verse 51? Do you remember? Jesus is on the cross, and he gives up his spirit, and the earth began to shake. And what else happened? And the veil of the temple rent from top to bottom symbolizing that God had opened up the way into the Holy of Holies. And I have to wonder whether that's not what the writer of Hebrews is referring to, where before, yes, even though the, the smoke from the altar of incense was, was close to the Holy of Holies, even though it was brought in to cover the ark for the priests, the, you would have the, the smoke because the, the priests, the high priest on the Day of Atonement couldn't look directly at what he was doing, that, that it properly belong there, some people say. I'm wondering that now that the veil has been torn from top to bottom and the way has been opened, that the prayers of the saint are symbolically right there in the Holy of Holy, even as they're in the heavenly Holy of Holies today. Well, in Christ, the prayers go directly to him. We, we go directly to our high priest, Jesus Christ, who's ministering in the Holy of Holies 24-7 for us. But what does that mean for you and for me? Well, there's a couple of things. In Romans chapter 8, verses 33 through 34, Paul writes this. He says, Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Jesus Christ who died. 
More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who's going to bring a charge against you? You see, Christ has already paid the price for you. Christ is already in the Holy of Holies as the high priest interceding on our behalf. Who's going to bring a charge against you when Christ is at the right hand of God interceding for you? Well, because the risen Lord's at the right hand of God interceding for us, Paul goes on and he says in verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Today many of you are going through hard times in your life. Maybe sickness, maybe a family member. May, it may just be something going on right now that's, that's really difficult to deal with. And so often when people go through difficult times, they tend to drift, don't they? In fact, they, they, God, why are you treating me this way? God, why, why aren't you answering my, my prayers? But Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, shall hardship, shall persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? Verses 38 and 39, Paul goes on, and he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that awesome? Sometimes we feel like we're by ourselves when we're going through real difficult problems, but we're not. We've got a God who loves us. We've got Christ who left heaven and died for our sins that we might find forgiveness. He didn't stay in the grave. He's ascended into heaven where he's our high priest interceding on our behalf every day. And so no matter what we're going through, we can go to him in prayer. Well, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. And we've had movies in recent days on, on the Ark and all kinds of uh, um, questions about what is it and, and uh, trying to make big on it here. But the, the Ark really is big. Do you know why the Ark is big? The ark is the symbol of God's presence on earth. In fact, some would say it's his throne. It's a, a big box, a rectangular box. It, it was made of acacia wood and overlaid inside and outside with pure gold. Now, what's interesting, I mentioned a little earlier that the, the tabernacle's holy of holies is 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. It was a tent. When Solomon made the temple, everything was double size. So it's 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet. And here where we see all of the articles of the temple were covered in pure gold. We find in the tabernacle that not only were the articles covered in pure gold in the tabernacle, but even the walls were gold. Even the doors were gold. Can you imagine walking in that room? Can you imagine going into that solid gold, everything solid gold, everywhere you turn, the reflections, the, the beauty, what message is being conveyed? It's the holiness of God that we have entered into that holiness and that pureness of the living God. Well, the Ark of the Covenant was, was covered in pure gold, but the Bible says here that there were three things that were in it. Now, by the time Solomon comes along with the dedication of the temple, we find that two of these items weren't in there. But here during the time of Moses, these three items, as the writer of Hebrews is describing it, are in there. And the first item that we see is the golden pot of manna. Now, you remember when the Israelites were out in the wilderness for 40 years, there was no food, there was no water. God miraculously provided for them with these white vanilla wafers that would come down in the morning that they could collect an omer, however much they wanted. They could collect it and they could eat it for that day. On the Sabbath day, they couldn't collect it. So the day before, they had to collect two days worth. But then every day, what, what wasn't used would begin to, to deteriorate. It would, it, 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 you couldn't eat it. It just became bad at that point. But what is the message in having the golden pot of manna? It's during the difficult journeys of life, God provides. God is faithful. When the Israelites needed that food, God miraculously provided that food for them. And it's a reminder of God's faithfulness and his miraculous provision for the Jewish people during the 40 years of the wilderness wandering. The second item that we see in there is Aaron's rod that had budded. 
You think, well, that's kind of strange. Well, if you walk around, around you've got a, a rod. That rod has been cut off. That, that rod is dead. It's dead wood. That's your cane that you're walking around or your staff. But if you remember, Aaron's priesthood, which had been assigned by God, was, a challenge, was challenged by others. And God said, I want you to bring 12 rods. One from representatives of each tribe, if you would. But 12 rods here, 12 staffs. And he said, the one that buds in the morning is the one that I have picked. And so in the morning, whose staff had budded? Whose staff had had flowers on it? It, it was Aaron's staff. And the message that was being conveyed to the Jewish people through that act, through that miraculous act, is that it's God who chooses who's going to be priests. And that was the message that he gave to them, that God is sovereign over who will be his priests and who will not be his priests. Well, the third item that was in the Ark, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, in the, in the days of Moses and in Solomon's day when he dedicated the temple, was the tablets of, of the covenant. Now, the tablets of the covenant, another name that we use for them, are the Ten Commandments. What's happened to them? over the years. You know, what's, what's, what's happened to the ark over the year? Where, where did everything go? Well, most people believe that the, the ark disappeared. It was destroyed something. We don't know for sure because the Bible doesn't tell us. Somewhere around the Babylonian captivity of Jerusalem. That's, that's when the ark disappeared. But if you read ahead into the book of Revelation, you'll see something really interesting in Revelation chapter 11, verse 19, right after the seventh trumpet is blown. And what you'll see is that heaven opens up. And guess what's seen there in heaven? The Ark of the Covenant. Isn't that strange? So we, we see that at some point in time, that Ark or, or something very similar to that Ark will reappear once again. Verse 5. And above it were the cherubim of the glory, overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot speak now in detail. And the writer's just kind of rushing along through all of these things, and he, he's not going to be able to go to this in detail. But he begins to talk about the cherubim that were seated above the Ark of the Covenant, which was believed to be the footstool of God on earth. It was believed to be God's throne. And it's interesting that whenever we see the cherubim, the cherubim are guardians. They're angels. They're angelic beings. They're some of the few angels that do have wings. You know, on TV, everyone has all these, these angels that have wings. And, and uh, we see cherubim, seraphim, the four living creatures. They, they do have wings. But as we look at the, the picture up here and the imagery of the, the cherubim, we always see them guarding the presence of God, guarding his holiness. Why would I say that? Do you remember in the Garden of Eden when you had Adam and Eve and they're walking with God and they're talking with God and they got banished from the garden? Who did they have with flaming swords guarding the entrance? It was the cherubim. We look at the ark and we see through the ark of the covenant that we have them right over that position which is, represents God's presence on earth. We see cherubim even in, in, in the later times in the book of Revelation around the very throne of God. And so the cherubim are guardians that are around the presence of God. Now, the Bible talks here, it says, uh, it says and above were the cherubim who are uh, of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. What's the mercy seat and what's the significance of that seat? But I want you to look, I shared with you that the, the Ark of the Covenant is a, a, a rectangular box that's covered in, in pure gold. Within that box, there's some very precious things. You've, you've got the, the Ten Commandments are in there. You've got the pot of gold, once again, or a pot of manna, excuse me, speaking of God's faithfulness and provision for Israel. You've got the, the staff that's in there. But if you notice, whoops, let me go back here one. If you notice up here, we've got a lid that's on the top. And I thought, it's really interesting the way they've got the lid on the top. And that lid is known as the mercy seat. Now, do you remember what I just told you was on the inside? You've got the law. The law brings condemnation. And so you've got this slab of pure gold on top of the ark, symbolically covering the, the, the condemnation that comes through the law. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies with blood, the blood of animals, the blood of a substitute, and he would sprinkle the blood on the top of the mercy seat. 
This mercy seat was con considered to be God's footstool on earth. And it's where mercy could be found. Now, isn't it interesting that as we, we see that, that, that covering covers the law, which symbolizes that which brings death and destruction to us. And when the blood's on there, that covers there. Warren Worsby says, On the Day of Atonement, the blood was sprinkled on this mercy seat to cover the, tab the tables of the law within the ark. God did not look at the broken law. He saw the blood. Christ is our mercy seat or propitiation. Propitiation, by the way, means satisfaction. Christ is our mercy seat or propitiation. But Christ's blood does not just cover sin temporarily like we saw in the Old Testament. It takes away sin. Amen? So as great as the Old Testament tabernacle was, it was just a picture of the reality to come in Christ. The blood of bulls and goats could never permanently remove sin. At the very best that they could do is just temporarily cover over sin. Verses 6 and 7. Now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services, but into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. Now, as we look at the Old Testament tabernacle, do you realize that the common person could not go in there? That means you or I, if we walked up there, we could not go in there. But the beauty in Jesus Christ is the way into the heavenly holy of holies. The way into the heavenly tabernacle has been open. And we've got an invitation to come. But not only to come, we've got the invitation to come boldly. And we can do that anytime, day or night. What's interesting to me is in the, the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, the high priest could come once a year, but the only way that he could come was if he brought that basin of blood and if he sprinkled that blood, which was symbolically, that animal that had died was symbolically a substitute for your sin and my sin, for the Jewish people. He would put that blood on there and then he could come in there. And today, only by the blood of Jesus Christ can we enter into the Holy of Holies. You see, the animals that were sacrificed in the Old Testament were a substitute. It was a message to the Jewish people that sin is very serious, that a price is going to have to be paid, a penalty for the sins that were committed. And it's very costly. And that blood would come. But today, as we go into the Holy of Holies in heaven, we go by the blood of Christ. That's the only way that we can enter. Christ has died for us. He is our mercy seat. We go to him with our prayer needs. Verse 8, the Holy of Holies, excuse me, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was, was still standing. So as we look at the first tabernacle, there's a message being communicated to, me, to you and me. The way to the holiest of all, or in other words, the holy of holies, was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. John MacArthur writes, the Levitical system did not provide any direct access into God's presence for his people. Rather, it kept them away. Near, nearness had to be provided by another way. This is the primary lesson which the Holy Spirit taught concerning the tabernacle. It teaches how inaccessible God is apart from the death of Jesus Christ. It's only through the death of Christ that the way to the Holy of Holies in heaven was opened for you and for me so that we could go. Verses 9 and 10. It was symbolic. The Greek word for symbolic, by the way, is paraboli. What word does that sound like? Parable right? What's a parable? A parable is a, it's an Old Testament foreshadow of something to be fulfilled in the New, New Testament. It, 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 no, that's a type. I'm sorry. Let me back off. I, I'm messing up here. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. Can we say that together? A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. So it was the symbolic it was symbolic, the parabole, for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to conscience, concerning only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. 
What's that time of reformation? It's when Jesus Christ comes. It's when the church is here. It's when there's a, a new order in which we live. Well, if the tabernacle in the, it was a parable, it was a, a large object lesson, what can we learn about Old Testament Judaism? Well, what we can learn is that something better is coming, that it was only temporary. It was only there to point us to something bigger and better that would be found in Jesus Christ. It's only to show us that something was about to become new. In fact, in Christ, we see that all things become new. We, we're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Look back to your old life and the changes that have transpired since you came to Christ. I'm hoping you're seeing some changes. If you're not seeing some changes, maybe, maybe you need to take a close look at your life and the way that you're living it. Another new uh, creation here, we, we see uh, we live under a new covenant. In other words, the new covenant is so much better than the old covenant. You remember under the old covenant, it was thou shalt, thou shalt, thou shalt. In other words, who did the responsibility fall on to fulfill the terms of that covenant? On the people. But under the new covenant, it was I will, I will, I will. And God fully took upon himself to fulfill the terms of that covenant. We have a new priesthood with a new high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Under the old covenant, we saw the Levitical priesthood, which was just temporary coverings. But in the case of this priesthood of Christ, we see permanent covers, the coverings that come. We worship at a new sanctuary, the heavenly holy of holies. In other words, we're not going to that tent out in the desert, but we're going to the holy of holies in heaven in our prayers and when we're worshiping. And then last, there's a new kind of sacrifice that has brought salvation and forgiveness to all who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Where everything else before was just pointing to what Christ would do, we have the privilege today of looking backward to what Christ did for us. You might wonder, how were the Old Testament saints saved? Have you ever wondered that? Do you know how it is? They're saved the same way we are, by grace through faith in Christ. But it's almost as if they're on credit cards. It's almost as if they're on, on credit, if you would. They're looking ahead to the coming Christ. And when Christ came and he died on the cross, then the benefits of that were appropriated to them in salvation. They're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, or in their case, in the coming Messiah. So lastly here, uh, once again, hopefully you've noticed some changes that have taken place in your life since coming to Christ. We see 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You know, when we come to Christ, you may not change overnight where everything's totally radically changed and, and uh, you're, you're living totally contrary to the way you lived before. But hopefully you'll see changes. And with time, more and more, we're becoming more and more like Christ. It doesn't mean we're not going to have ups and downs. But hopefully we're moving in a direction in which we're falling more and more in love with God and we're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Verse 11, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and the more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. In other words, everything on that earthly tabernacle pointed to some aspect of the, the work in the ministry of Jesus Christ that he would ultimately be fulfilling in heaven. Jesus is high priest in the order of Melchizedek, serving in that heavenly holy of holies. And with that in mind, we go to this whole issue of what the writer of Hebrews was writing about. You had all of these Hebrew Christians that are thinking about giving up on Christ and going back into Judaism. Jesus is greater than, Jesus is better than any of these. Why would they ever want to turn around? You know, I wonder in times in our life, if, if, if we get frustrated and we begin to, to give up on the Lord when things don't go our way. I don't know how many times I've spoken to people that get angry with God and they walk away with them. This, this isn't what I planned, God. But we need to realize that God has promised that all things work together for the good of those who love him who are the call according to his purpose. And we may not see the reason things are happening right now, but I guarantee you down the road we will. And God will only work for, for that which is good. Verse 12, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. He entered into the most holy place once for all, obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of bulls and goats and 
calves could never solve the problem of human sin. Only Jesus could. William MacDonald says he, meaning Christ, offered his own blood, not the blood of bulls and goats. Animals' blood had no power to put away sins. It was effective only in cases of technical offenses against religious ritual. It's important we understand that. Yeah? The, the, the blood of bulls and goats was never, inten- never intended to permanently take away sin. It had to do with religious ritual here and a temporary covering. But the blood of Christ is of infinite value. Its power is sufficient to cleanse all of the sins of all people who have ever lived, all people who are now living, all the people who will ever, ever live. Amen. Of course, its power is applicable only to those who come to him by faith. But its cleansing potential is unlimited. By his sacrifice, he obtained eternal redemption. The former priests obtained annual atonement. There's a vast difference between the two. Rather than a temporary covering in Christ Jesus, we have permanent forgiveness. Our sins are taken away. Our sins are taken as far as the east is from the west. Verses 13 through 14 get a little interesting here. It says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling with unclean, sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, provided temporary, this provided temporary ritual cleaning, this, this ashes of a heifer. What in the world are you talking about? Did you know that the red heifer is very important to the nation of Israel for for ritual cleansing? And that the picture that you're looking up on the screen right now is actually one of the red heifers. They've got a whole herd in Israel that they're raising. They've been uh, trying to breed these, these red heifers. And throughout the entire history of Israel, there's only been six that they've had. And the, the, uh, the, the purpose of the ashes of the red heifer were if individuals came into contact with a dead body, for a period of seven days, they're ritually unclean. How could you get around that? They would get the ashes of a perfectly red heifer. They would get pure spring water. They would take those ashes, just very small amounts of them, put them in the spring water, spring water, get some hyssop, and they would sprinkle it on you. And ceremonially, that would bypass the seven days that you were ceremonially unclean. And so they would be able to use it for cleansing. So for Israel, as they're getting ready for the new temple to be built, it's really important for them to have, have the red heifer once again. And so they're working very hard on, uh, on that. Uh, the solution when you did touch a dead body was to, to have the water of separation or the water for impurity sprinkled on you. Now, the Taspit News Agency writes a little bit about the breeding techniques that are going on right now and how they're trying to raise up the red heifers once again. Uh, It says this, it says, in order to carry out this project, the Temple Institute has joined forces with an experienced Israeli cattle farmer, rancher, who is an expert in the science of animal husbandry. Under the the Halachek supervision, and guidance of the rabbis of the temp- Temple Institute, the cattle rancher is utilizing technique of implanting the frozen embry- embryos of the red Angus cattle, which originally came from North America, and they're doing that into the Israeli cattle. We can select proper candidates from those calves that are born. They will be cared for under specific instructions, explained Rabbi Richman of Tazpit. The end result of this program will be the introduction of the Red Angus breed into Israel, said Rabbi Richen, who also added that it would improve the quality of cattle in Israel. This method, authorized and approved by Israel's Ministry of Agriculture, has already proven successful with the birth of a number of male Red Angus. I understand the herd is somewhere in the area of 70 right now. Raising a perfect red heifer in accordance with the biblical commandment requires advanced planning, preparation, and constant supervision, according to Rabbi Richman. In order for the red heifer to be considered kosher for biblical use, it must literally be raised from birth under specific conditions and in a controlled environment, which has never been attempted in Israel during modern times. 
And as we move towards the end times, you see things happening in Israel with the temple and with the objects of, of, of the temple. And even to the point of heaven, the red heifer that's ready for the ritual cleansing of the Jewish people. But the red heifer was used to ritually cleanse for religious service after a touching, touching a, a dead body. But religious ritual can never change the human heart. It's interesting how hard people try to become religiously pure. The picture you're looking at right now is the, the church of the Holy Sepulchre. And the object that you're looking at in the middle of that, that all the people are, are circling around, is called the eticule. And that's believed by some to be where the tomb of Christ was. And so within this church, they've got like six different religious groups. And we saw that when we were there. They'd just swing and they would change from group to group. But walking around or doing some particular outward religious sign or, or, or symbol or some kind of work will never cleanse the human body. It will never cleanse the human mind. Only Jesus Christ can do that. You see, Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Do you know who can know the heart? God knows the heart. In fact, the only way for permanent cleansing to come is through faith in Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit working in you. But what kind of dead works are being spoken of here? Some people think, well, the dead works that they're talking about are the rituals of the Mosaic Law. Other people think the dead works that they're talking about are people trying to go out there and earn their salvation. We don't see too many Christians today trying to follow the rituals of the Mosaic Law, although there's some that are out there. But we see a lot of people in the world who are trying to earn their salvation, don't we? And one of the stories of the Bible that we need to understand clearly is there is nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. It's completely a gift from God. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 says this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. Wait a minute, I'm good. I've been good throughout my life. I, I'm better than the person down the street. I'm better than Adolf Hitler. Whoa, wait a minute. Do you see what it says? For by grace you've been saved. How? Through faith. Now let's make it clear. That's not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. But then we miss verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. In other words, we're not saved, friends, by our, our good works. We're saved unto good works in Christ. After coming to faith, we, we owe him our life. We ought to go out there and live our life in a way that would honor him and please him. But notice that under the Old Testament law, the animals were, were brought involuntarily to be slaughtered. They didn't realize why they were being brought to the altar. But in verse 14, what we learn is that Christ fully knew. And Christ was fully willing to come and to be our substitute. In fact, Jesus willingly died for you, and he died for me. And because he was the substitutionary atonement, he was our substitute, <sighs> It was his blood that was shed instead of ours. Because of that, Jesus became the mediator of the new covenant. You see, Jesus had accomplished through his own blood what the old covenant never could. Verse 15, and we'll wrap it up with this. It says, and for this reason, he is the mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Those who are called. Who's he talking about? We've got an open invitation to everyone out there to receive the gospel, but that's not what's being spoken of here. I think what's being spoken of here is something that's called effectual calling. And when the call goes out, they come in. You're talking about believers here. People who have come to Christ. Those, those are the called. He's become the mediator, mediator of a new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal inheritance. You see, it was necessary that Jesus die so that we could receive our eternal inheritance. It's amazing to me, and maybe you've been through it in your own life, when you, you get somebody who's who maybe even a solid believer in Christ. Maybe it's just a, a family member. Maybe it's your father, somebody. You get a parent who passes away, and what happens to the family? 
all of a sudden you have war. Everybody is fighting for the inheritance. Everybody wants what they want now. But you know what's different about this inheritance? In this particular case, Jesus died for our sins. But on the other hand, Jesus rose again from the dead. So Jesus not only paid the penalty, he's not only the tester, he, he not only paid the penalty for our sins and, and died on the cross, but he rose again so that he can be the uh, executor of his own will. This inheritance that we're going to receive is eternal. We're not going to have a fight here. Jesus is doing this. Well, God just doesn't speak through his word. And what I want you to see today is that he speaks through object lessons. The old covenant tabernacle was a very large object lesson that pointed towards the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross in his high priestly work in heaven, which is the only way that you and I can know today for sure that we're saved because Jesus is there on a daily basis ministering for us. Father, thank you for, for your word. And as we look back in the Old Testament tabernacle, there's so many signs and symbols and it's hard to understand uh, all of this. But Lord, the closer we look, the closer we see the work of Jesus. In the lampstand, we see Jesus as the light of the world. In the table of showbread, we see that, that Jesus is the bread of life who gives us strength spiritually to go on on our journey, Lord, towards heaven. In the altar of incense, Lord, we, we, see, we, we see the prayers of the saints being lifted up. And Lord, with the rending of the curtain, we see those prayers now in the Holy of Holies. We see the Ark of the Covenant, Lord, which is the footstool of God on earth. And Lord, that mercy seat which covers up the condemnation of the law which Christ did for us and the sprinkling of the blood which represents the blood of Jesus that only in him can we find mercy. And Lord, I, I thank you for this object lesson that teaches us so much about you. And yet for us to be in a right relationship with you today, Lord, we need to be in a right relationship with Jesus. And if there's anyone here who's struggling, I, I pray that they would turn back to you right now. Lord, if they've walked away, I pray that they would come to you the only way to salvation. And Lord, if there's someone here today as well who's never received Christ, I pray that not another day would go by without that happening. And I just ask that they might pray a, a prayer like this. Lord, I have so messed up my life, and I ask you to forgive me. I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God. I pray that you come into my heart and life, Lord. Help me to be the kind of man, woman, boy or girl that you desire for me to be. This day I surrender my life to you. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.